Hello everyone, it's Mr. Spinelli. Today I'm going to give you a little rundown of the key topics in AP Calculus AB. So one of the first things you see is limits. Now remember, the limit exists at a point. C, if the limit from the left equals the limit as x approaches from the right. Very basic definition. Limit from the left has to equal the limit from the right. Now we can use limits to discuss some asymptotic behavior. In particular, horizontal asymptotes are when we take the limit of a function as x goes to positive or negative infinity. Now you can have situations where the numerator and denominator have equal degrees, and in that case your limit will just be the ratio of those coefficients on the leading term. And you can also see this result if you apply L'Hopital a number of times. And then you also have situations where the numerator has a degree that is greater, and in those cases you will go to positive or negative infinity. You've got to be careful if there's square roots or odd powers involved uh, when you look at these kinds of limits. And then you've got situations where the denominator has a greater power, so then these situations your limit will go to zero when the denominator has a greater degree. Okay, so then, then we can also look at limits to address vertical asymptotes. And in this case, we're approaching a number. So x is approaching some number, and the limit either doesn't exist or it approaches positive or negative infinity. So I just got a simple example, rational function 1 over x minus 3. From the left, it goes to negative infinity. From the right, it goes to positive infinity. Therefore, the limit does not exist. Now, we'll never say that an infinity equals an infinity. So if this were like 1 over the absolute value of x minus 3, you could still say the limit doesn't exist, or you could say the limit is positive infinity. Uh, both of those would be acceptable. The limit doesn't exist, but the function tends towards positive infinity. Now, limits are also very useful in continuity. Now, we're only going to add one little thing to our equation. So typically, the limit has to equal be the same from the left and the right. But for a function to be continuous, we also need that limit to equal the value of the function. So the limit must equal the value of the function at a particular point. Then there's removable discontinuities that you might see. Um, and this is where you'll have a hole. So an example of that might be x minus 3 over x squared minus 9. Now you can factor the x squared minus 9 as x plus 3 and x minus 3. And that x minus 3 component simplifies to 1, so you have a hole at x equals 3. The limit will still exist there, but the function will not be continuous because the function's not defined there. Then you run into the situation where you take limits, and more often than not, you're going to want to apply L'Hopital. Now, L'Hopital basically just says that if you see 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, that's an indeterminate form, then you apply L'Hopital by taking the derivative of the top and the bottom separately. You don't apply quotient rule. You just take the derivative of both the numerator and the denominator separately, and then plug in your value that you're approaching. If that returns another indeterminate form, you keep applying L'Hopital until you get a constant zero or infinity, some kind of number or thing you're used to seeing when you take a limit. Now, if you don't get an indeterminate form, you may need to rewrite it. So if you can't apply L'Hopital because you don't get 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, then you need to rewrite it or apply some other algebraic manipulation to the problem. Okay. Now, if you have graphs, same rules apply. The limit exists if the function approaches the same value from the left and the right. Limits can exist at holes. So here we've got you know, a nice little graph. As we go to negative infinity, you see the little arrow, so it's going to go to negative infinity. The limit of this function as we go to negative 3. From the left, it approaches 2. From the right, it approaches negative 4. So the limit as x goes to negative 3 doesn't exist. Now, as x goes to 1, it does exist. Even though the function is defined at a different value, it's positive 2 when x is 1, but the function approaches negative 2 as x goes to 1. And that's that hole down below the x-axis. Now as x approaches 4, the limit does not exist. It goes to positive infinity from the left, and from the right it doesn't even approach anything at all. 
then the limit as x goes to positive infinity is simply positive infinity because we got an arrow pointing up. Tables, very much the same thing as graphs. You're looking for the limit to be the same on both sides. And if necessary, make a little sketch. So here we've got a table. We're going to look again at that limit as we go to negative infinity, which it appears it's approaching negative 1. So we probably have a horizontal asymptote of y equals negative 1. Now as we go to negative 5, it appears some more interesting things are happening. We approach negative 2. Then as x goes to positive 2, from the left it looks like it's negative infinity because we've got that negative 19,000 large number. But as we come from the right, x equals 2.0001, we're approaching 17,000 positive. So from the left, it's negative infinity. From the right, it's approaching positive infinity. Therefore, the limit doesn't exist. And then as x goes to infinity, it appears the value is going towards 3. So this particular function that we've been given a table for has a horizontal asymptote at y equals negative 1 and y equals 3. And it appears it also has a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. So then we get into derivatives, and initially derivatives are defined as a limit because you start with secant lines, which are just average rates of change. So you can see in this little GIF that as those two points that are on either side of that black dot, when they're far away, we're approximating the average rate of change at that point x equals 1. And we do that by just computing the slope, slope old school way, change in y over change in x. Then we get to instantaneous rate of change. So we want those two points you see right now, they squeeze close to the black dot. That is the so-called tangent line. As they get right onto that dot, we've got a tangent line. And you first see that using what's called the difference quotient. So the derivative is defined as a limit. It's the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Now if I wanted to find the derivative at that particular black dot, I can apply it by using the limit as x goes to a, and in this case I would say a is 1. So f of x minus f of a over x minus a. So these are the derivatives in the context of limits, which is how you first see derivatives. And then you talk about differentiability, very much like continuity. So first you need to check that a function is continuous. So you check that the limit from the left equals the limit from the right equals the actual function's value. So you can't have a hole, it's got to be filled in, and the function's got to approach that filled in dot from both sides. Then you check the continuity of f prime of x. So you take the derivative, and you can do this using limits, or you can just take the derivative if you have the function. Then you're checking that the derivative is the same on the left and the right, and that it is defined at the value c. Once you've verified both of those things, then the function is differentiable. Remember, a differentiable function is continuous. So oftentimes the AP test will say function f is differentiable. Therefore, you know it is also continuous. If you're going to apply a theorem like intermediate value theorem, you need to specify that because it's differentiable, it's also continuous. Therefore, intermediate value theorem applies. You need to be able to clearly state how you know the things you know. So here's just a little example of why you need to check the continuity of the function. So this particular function has a slope of 1 on both sides, so you might think it's differentiable, but it's not continuous. It's got to be continuous to be differentiable. So then here, speaking of your theorems, intermediate value theorem, remember the word intermediate just means in between. So if we've got a continuous function on some closed interval from A to B, then there is some x value between a and b such that we'll hit the values in between. So here's a nice little gif to show you. We're hitting every value between those two blue dots. Your function may go above, as you see ours does, but you know for a fact that it's going to hit every value between those two blue dots. And again, your function has to be continuous. And then we've got the mean value theorem mean value theorem, we need continuous and differentiable. And again, it can be differentiable on just the open interval. And then that just means that we can find some point that's going to have the slope. See that blue line in this GIF? That's the slope between our two endpoints. And our function's continuous and differentiable between those two endpoints. And you're going to see here, as that blue dot moves along, in just a moment, that red line is going to turn green. 
because there's a point where the tangent line right there is equal to the average slope between those endpoints. In this particular particular function, there's two points. You see in just a moment, this red line is going to turn green right near the top, right about there. And again, we see that there exists at least one point where the instantaneous rate of change is the same as the average rate of change over that interval. Now, you also have Rolle's theorem, which is just the same exact thing, except f of a is equal to f of b. So those two blue dots would be perfectly in line, perpendicular to the x-axis, having the same y value, which means we know the slope has to be 0 at least once between those two points. Speaking of derivatives, you've got all your different rules. You've got power rule. You've got quotient rule. Uh, but the big one that you've got to remember is chain rule. Chain rule can be, it appears everywhere. So just remember, you work your way from the outside in. Then you've got inverse functions. Remember, a function is an inverse of one another if you compose them and you get x as a result. So f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x. And I've just written it here two different ways, so you're aware of the ways it can be presented on a test. And then remember that you've got some fancy formula for remembering the rules. Now, I always just remember that I need to solve for the function value given. So if I'm given f or g, depends on which one I'm given, if I plug an x value into one of the functions, let's say I plug a into g, and it gives me b, that means ab is a point on g, which means ba is a point on f. So if I want to find the derivative of g at a, I need to do the inverse, the reciprocal, I should say, of the derivative at b of f. So g prime of a is equal to the reciprocal of f prime of b. Again, it helps to write all that you know about f on one side and all that you know about g on the other side, and remember that the x and y values are going to flip-flop. They're going to switch roles. And the derivative at one point is the reciprocal of the derivative at the corresponding point for the other function. Then you've got implicit differentiation. This is where you need to remember that y is a function of x. So every time you take the derivative of y, you're going to get a dy dx. So for example, this function, my first term is going to give me 2x. My second term, I've got x times y. Both of those things involve x, because y is a function of x. So I've got to use product rule. And then for the sine term, y is inside of sine, so I'm going to have chain rule. Same with e to the y. So I should get a result that looks like this. The 2y plus 2x dy dx, that second and third term on the left side, both of those come from 2xy using product rule. And then you're going to want to group all the dy dx's together and then ultimately divide by what dy dx is multiplied by to get your derivative. And remember, when you have to take a second derivative, it's going to involve dy dx. So you'll need to be sure to plug this back in to your second derivative. If it asks you to evaluate, just plug numbers in and you don't have to simplify. But if it asks for what is the second derivative, you need to be sure to plug this 2x plus 2y, yada, 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 into your second derivative result. Applications, derivatives are very useful for finding extrema, maxes and mins. So the first derivative test, you're going to take the derivative, set it equal to 0, and make a sign chart. Remember that the sign chart is not your justification. You have to explicitly say, I know the function is switching from increasing to decreasing because f prime goes from positive to negative. Okay? And this should say, explain where... Okay, so when f prime of x changes from positive to negative, that is when the function f of x changes from increasing to decreasing. I must explain my sign chart. Second derivative test, once I know my critical numbers where the derivative is 0, I simply need to compute the second derivative at those points. If it's positive, I know it's concave up, which I mean that means it's smiling, if you will, so I know I'm sitting at a relative minimum. If it's the second derivative is negative, then I know the function is concave down, so I'm frowning, and I'm sitting at the top of a hill at a relative max.
To find absolute max and mins, you have to check the endpoints as well. So not just the critical numbers where you had the derivative was zero or undefined. You need to also check the endpoints. Key thing in calculus, first semester, is remembering how to connect a function to its derivatives and vice versa. So whenever you're given a function, you know that the first derivative is positive when your function is increasing, and it's negative when your function is decreasing. You know the second derivative is positive when the function f of x is concave up or smiling. You know the second derivative is negative when the original function is concave down or frowning. When you're given the derivative f prime, you know that the original function is increasing or decreasing when f prime is positive or negative, so above or below the x-axis. And you know that f of x has local extrema when the sign changes for that first derivative. So it goes from positive to negative or negative to positive. And then you know when the function f of x is concave up or concave down because the second derivative is the derivative of f prime. So when f prime is increasing, going up, then you know f of x is concave up. When f prime of x is decreasing, going down, then you know f of x is concave down. Now when, and that's just, this, is, this next bullet point is the same exact thing I just said, because you know that the second derivative is positive when the function f of x is concave up. So that's just the same statement, but sometimes you've got to consider when this involves position, velocity, and acceleration, you've got to make all of these connections. Now you know the function f of x has inflection points when f prime of x has local extrema because what's happening is the concavity is changing. Because f prime of x is going from positive to negative, that means the second derivative, f double prime, is going from positive increasing to decreasing. So when the f prime goes from increasing to decreasing, f double prime is going from positive to negative. When you're given the second derivative, there's not as much that you can tell, but you do know when the function f of x is concave up or down based on when f double prime is positive or negative and you know when f prime of x is increasing or decreasing and that's simply based on when it's concave up or concave down so when f double prime is positive or negative then you've got position velocity acceleration which very much ties into what we just discussed so position is often described by x of t it tells you where an object is velocity is the derivative of position it tells you the speed and direction. Speed is the magnitude of velocity and direction when your function v of t is positive your object is moving in the positive direction which is often to the right or forward and when the velocity is negative it's moving left or backward in the negative direction. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity which means it's the second derivative of acceleration and it measures the change in an object's velocity, which, remember, involves speed and direction. So acceleration can be a change in speed, it can be a change in direction, or it can be a change in both. So when acceleration and velocity are the same sign, then the speed is increasing. When they're opposite signs, the speed is decreasing. When acceleration is positive, that means the velocity is increasing. When it's negative, that means the velocity is decreasing. So there's a key distinction between the difference in velocity and speed. Then you've got function behavior. So you can tell when a function is increasing or decreasing. And again, that's based on knowing where the function has uh, derivatives where the points are zero or uh, do not exist. Um, and you're going to make a sign chart. You know when it's concave up or down based on taking the second derivative, setting it equal to zero, solving for those points to determine uh, where the function has concave up, concave down intervals by using a sign chart for it as well. Inflection points, the second derivative must be zero and the second derivative must change sign at that particular point. And more importantly, it's got to actually be a point on the function. So you've got to be sure that if you want to determine if something is an inflection point, it has to be defined for that point. Linearization, 
key thing is you need to write a linear equation. So you need a point, you need a slope, and you need to write an equation. And you often do that in point-slope form. Optimization, you're just looking for max and min, local extrema. So the goal is to often write a function as a single variable. Usually this requires using the volume or area or perimeter. You have some perimeter of fence. You have a certain amount of material to make a box. So that's a surface area constraint. So you're going to need to solve for x as a function of y or y as a function of x. Or you may decide to use different letters to represent the base and height and width of a box. But the goal is still the same. Find the extrema using the first and or second derivative tests and check your endpoints. So sometimes you aren't explicitly given an endpoint. Think of the classic problem where you got to cut a corner from a piece of paper. You can only cut so much paper before you can't even make a box. And you've got to cut something or you can't make a box. So there's usually some constraints on what are so-called impossible values. Think about the context of the problem to determine what endpoints you have to check. Related rates, very much like implicit differentiation. Everything is a function of whatever variable you're dealing with unless that particular quantity is a constant. Pi is a constant. E is a constant. If the cone is restricted to some particular dimension, the height of the water is going to certainly change. The radius is also going to change. But if we switch that cone to a cylinder, the radius is not going to change as we fill it up with water. This particular example is when you've got some kind of triangle, so you're going to connect things using Pythagorean theorem. Maybe one car is moving in one direction to the east, the other one's moving to the north. What's the rate of change between those two cars? You're looking for dc dt. Uh, and then you've got your classic uh, volume of a cylinder, pi r squared h. So here's an example where that dr dt is likely zero because odds are the radius of your cylinder is not changing. But I've just written out what that derivative would look like using related rates. Everything is a function of time except for the pi. And then you may have something that involves angles. So this might have involved some kite floating into the air or something along those lines. And remember, whenever dealing with problems on the AP test, all angles are in radians unless otherwise specified. Next big topic is semester two. You're jumping into integrals. First thing you often do is approximate integrals, and you do that with Riemann sums. You need to remember the area of a rectangle, simply the length times the width or base times the height. You've got left Riemann sums, right Riemann sums, and midpoint Riemann sums. Remember that a left Riemann sum is going to be an over approximation when the function is increasing, and the right will be an over approximation when the function is decreasing. So you've got your rules for remembering that. Trapezoidal sum, you've got to remember the area formula for a trapezoid. It's going to be an over approximation when the function is concave up, and it's going to be under when it's concave down. If you do not remember this, which I don't bother remembering it, I always draw a picture. The picture will help you determine if you are sketching things above, if your rectangles or trapezoids are above the function, it's going to be an over approximation. Otherwise, it's going to be under. Midpoint is going to be somewhere in between, so you're often not asked to assess whether the estimate would be over or under for a midpoint. Then you get into summation notation. This is how we then extend the Riemann sum to an infinite sum. You need to be able to go both directions using this, these formulas. Remember that the integral can be written as an infinite sum. So add up all of those rectangles of the infinitesimally wide rectangles and you will get the exact area. So here's just an example. You're integrating from negative 5 to 8. That's a distance of 13. So you see that 13 over n occurring as the delta x. The initial point a is negative 5. So that's wherever you see an x, x squared and the cosine of x. It's replaced with negative 5 plus that delta x times i. i is just a counter to move you along to more and more rectangles. And then recall, you've got to take the limit as n goes to infinity. So you've got to be able to go both directions, left to right and right to left. Then you get into 
the fundamental theorem of calculus, which basically just says that the integral from a to b is whatever that antiderivative is, that function evaluated at b minus the value evaluated at a. And I've written just two versions of it. Oftentimes you're given a, a graph of f prime, let's say, and it tells you an initial condition, like at x equals 2, f of x is equal to 3. So you know 2 comma 3 is a point. And let's say it wants you to find f of 7. Well, what you're going to want to do is use this bottom equation, integrate from x equals 2 to x equals 7, because you know the value of the function f at 2. So you'll know f of a on that right side. And you're probably given a picture that you can determine the area between x equals 2 and 7. So you can determine the left side of this equation, which allows you to solve for f of b, which is f of 7, that point that you're looking for. Now the other thing to remember is you need to remember that the area is associated with this integral. It's positive when it's above the x-axis, and it's negative when it's below the x-axis. And then remember, too, that you can split it into pieces. So if I want to break down the integral from negative 1 to 3, I can go from negative 1 to 1, 1 to 2, and then 2 to 3. And then also, if I switch the order of integration, I've got to remember that it becomes the opposite value. So if I integrate from a to b, that's the opposite sign of if I integrate from b to a. This is very useful when I was talking about those top two equations. When you're connecting a function given to you with its area and some initial condition to find the value of the antiderivative at some other point. So oftentimes you've got to remember what direction you're going. Then we got the FTC part two, which is really just taking the derivative of the previous fundamental theorem. Key things to note in these two equations. The top one is integrating from a constant to x. That one is nice and easy. The bottom one is integrating from some function of x to some other function of x. So I've got to remember to apply chain rule. Do not forget chain rule when applying FTC part two. Techniques, you've seen a bunch of them, but you've got u sub. u sub, you're usually just looking for some function that's inside of another function and whose derivative is outside of that said function and it may be some multiple of that function so you've got to deal with some constants remember to change the limits of your integration if you've got a definite integral otherwise just focus on looking for some function whose derivative is elsewhere other techniques are long division and completing the square um, these are a little less common, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about those. Then you've got applications. So remember that integrals are accumulation of change. So you've got your average value, you're integrating from A to B, and you're dividing by the width between A and B. Position, velocity, acceleration, total distance traveled, you're integrating the absolute value of velocity, whereas with displacement, you're just integrating velocity from two endpoints. Then you often run into the FRQs where you see units involved. So let's say a function has units of cubic feet per hour. So it gave me f of x, and then it's going to ask me a series of questions. Well, I often like to write, what's f prime's units going to be? What are the units of f double prime going to be? What are the units going to be if I have to integrate? So as you notice, that independent variable time hours ends up getting we end up dividing our units by time as we take derivatives and we multiply by time as we integrate as we go up if you will so these are just this is just an example of the units that you would encounter so if it wanted me to say how many cubic feet are going to be in the pool if f of x is defining the rate at which water is entering the pool? I'm going to have to integrate to get cubic feet. If it's asking me how is the rate at which the water is entering the pool changing, I'm going to have to take the derivative. And my units are going to be feet per cubed per hour per hour, which some of us struggle to wrap our heads around what that means. In this particular case, that top unit, feet cubed per hour, it makes a lot more sense if you deal with units of uh, man hours. So oftentimes, if you're working in the business world, you may see man hours. Um, otherwise, those of you that take physics, 
you know that newtons times meters quantifies energy. So then just extending on that, let's say f of x still has units of cubic feet per hour. If we were to integrate, we know we get feet cubed. So if we integrate from a to b, then we know between, let's say, time x equals a and time x equals b, we've accumulated so x amount of feet cubed, x amount of cubic feet during that time frame. You may also be asked, what's the average across that interval? Well, now you're dividing that cubic feet by the time, b minus a. So now your units are back in feet cubed per hour. We found the average rate of change, f of x. And then here's just showing you, well, what if you're looking at f prime of x? So notice that all the results on the left just got divided by time. And lastly, you've got differential equations. Um, so often you may be seeing a slope field. You're going to look for lines of constant slope. Uh, don't draw anything where the slope is undefined because you don't know what's going on with the original function. And then lastly, if you have to draw a particular solution through a point, go with the flow. Sometimes you might have to verify solutions. That just means if a particular differential equation says 3y double prime minus y prime equals 0, and it gives you that a potential solution is, is y equals 2x, well, you're going to take the first and the second derivative, plug it into that original equation to see if it actually does equal 0. And then lastly, you've got separation of variables. So you're going to want to get the x's on the side with dx and the y's on the side with dy, and then integrate both sides respectively. When you're looking for a general solution, you don't have to solve for c. When you're looking for a particular solution, you do need to solve for c using some initial condition, which is going to be a point. So thank you very much for watching, and good luck on your tests.